The Industrial Revolution. Recycling the Old World. The Industrial Revolution is often cited by proponents of the mainstream account as incontrovertible proof for all the wondrous achievements of our current civilization. Our age of plastic and disposability, our ability to rapidly construct incredible skyscrapers of glass and steel, such as the Burj Khalifa. Yet, we look at these buildings and we question, how do they really compare with the buildings of the past, such as the state capitol in Atlanta, Georgia? An edifice that was constructed in four years with very different construction processes and yet at the latter portion of what we're told is the official Industrial Revolution, the second one that occurred after the United States Civil War. When you look at the opulent beauty of the Georgia State Capitol, you ask yourself, which building would you rather be in, the State Capitol or a glass and steel tower? Also, how do you explain these incredible carvings done long before the Industrial Revolution? When people think of the Industrial Revolution, this tends to be the image that they have in mind. Vast factories encompassing small towns and suddenly the ability to mass produce many products. But what are really the causes of the Industrial Revolution? This is one of my favorite slides that a student submitted some countless years ago, and it's kept in its natural state. The revolution originated in Great Britain in the 1750s and continued in the 19th century. And why did this happen? It's a combination of factors. Population growth, agricultural improvements, increased trade, technological progress, financial support from agriculture and trade, and the favorable political and social structure, of course. But when we look at these combination of factors, and you'll find that the cause and effect of history is always a combination of factors, consider the fact that the population growth came all about from agricultural improvements. Everything really came from the agricultural improvements. So we have to look at the agricultural improvements to understand exactly how the Industrial Revolution came about, because we never had agricultural improvements before. Well, except for when we did, according to the official account. There are numerous agricultural revolutions that are documented in numerous different nations, societies, and cultures. Yet we're focused here on Great Britain, or the United Kingdom with three main causes, the Magna Carta, the Rise of the Yeomen, and the Rule of the Major Generals. Magna Carta being the agreement with King John and the Barons, signifying he would not trot on their rights. Rise of the Yeomen, the real middle class, the educated independent farmers, if you will. At least that's what they'd say the Yeomans were. And then the Rule of the Major Generals, a period during the so-called Cromwellian era that only lasted about 16 to 17 months, where a major general had responsibility over an area and the United Kingdom and the subsequent settlers of what became the United States didn't really care for this period. They saw these puritanical major generals as killjoys. Well, how exactly did this transition the United Kingdom or Great Britain at the time into a place where we could have an industrial revolution? Consider the plan of a medieval manor. Everything was based on feudalism, where you had a lord that owned the land, and you had people that were associated with the land, and they farmed the land, and that's how they produced the yield that fed the population. In fact, one of the great causes for the bubonic plague being so devastating was because of the fact that there was a famine due to the changes in weather. At least that's what the official history tells us. You can find supposed examples of how the land was divided back in that time, and you can see it's all centered around the manor and the house and the church, and the land was divided in terms of who could farm what. Well, because of these changes that we talked about earlier in Great Britain with the Magna Carta, which supposedly had a lot of effects on society, also, the rise of the yeomen, and finally, the rule of the major generals, it encouraged the farmers to take things upon themselves to improve things. And there were vast agricultural improvements, a result of which increased the population and suddenly increased demand. Now, it's one of those questions, though, as to what came first, the chicken or the egg, and you find that with the Industrial Revolution. It just happened to be a perfect confluence of situations that arose, and suddenly it led to this incredible industrial machine factory culture that just seemed to really come out of nowhere, especially in the 19th century. It's always the 19th century. Why is it the 19th century? You'll find no shortage, though, of images depicting large machines and also depicting very large structures. It's an interesting aspect of the account, though, to consider how these large structures and machines themselves were actually constructed before even having the means or the abilities to do so. And most people will simply tell you, well, it's because people worked harder then. They were willing to put in the 10 to 20 to 100 years to build a cathedral. So why wouldn't they be willing to put the 10 to 20 to 100 years to build a textile machine? 
And of course, you're saying that I'm exaggerating a little bit. Well, no, not really, especially not when you look at some of the advancements that you see that supposedly come from the Industrial Revolution. Yet we have many examples of societies and civilizations that had great architectural achievements before the Industrial Revolution. Well, then you'll say, and that is exactly how you can justify the building of these very large compounds that we would call factories, the large smokestacks. I was always completely blown away, though, even when I was younger, looking at many of the images of the Industrial Revolution and the very large machinery that was required. One of the aspects of it is that mass production and interchangeable parts, which were supposedly innovations of the 19th century or so, were told. Yet it's odd that the Industrial Revolution has such a wide swath of time. You know, it goes from 1760 to 1900. It's not a singular event. It's a combination of factors, and it's more of an amorphous event. And one of the things that always struck me about the study of history, and when you see this compound, you certainly get that question yourself, why is everything always so amorphous? And the answer to that will be is because we have uniformitarianism. In other words, the idea that things take a long period of time, and they always conform to consistent factors. Yet the Industrial Revolution has many separate causes, and you can see here 1750 to 1900. And one of the causes was low farm wages. People were getting paid poorly on the farm, so they decided to go work in a factory because they would get better wages. And we certainly know how well that worked out. That's what led to the rise of the union movement in the early 20th century, especially in the United States, but across the land. Science, of course, because science always explains everything. Rapid advancements in construction techniques. A demand for products. What exactly came first, though? The demand or the availability of the products? Another good question to ask. And then finally, mechanization. And mechanization is very interesting in and of itself because we consider the fact that most of the heavy machinery that we use today didn't come about until the early 20th century. When you look at other images on how people lived during the height of the Industrial Revolution, you often have images like this. It looks like squalor and some sort of post-war image. Then you contrast that with other images of these machines, and it's intriguing to me how things always appeared so unbelievably old. And yet this was supposedly new when a lot of these images were taken. There's also the other aspect of really dissecting the Industrial Revolution, and many people tell you we're in four revolutions. That there were four aspects of a revolution that completely changed our society and civilization. You have the first, which was mechanization, water power, steam power, that came from the 19th century. Now look at the second phase of it, mass production, assembly line, and electricity. Well, when exactly did that second phase really occur? Did it occur in the end of the 19th century? Was it really more in the 20th century? Well, what the official history will tell you was that the assembly line was around in the 19th century, but we'll find there's an example of an effective assembly line that occurred much before then. And we also have our questions about electricity. Finally, the third and the fourth with computer and automation and cyber physical systems. Yes, we've seen what wondrous advancements our cyber physical systems have given us in the 21st century. It's why our civilization has leaped so far since 2001. And perhaps I'm being a little facetious, and yet at the same time, I'm not. Yet, you look at these massive complexes and you can see these incredibly large machines that were all built mostly before what we saw as the second phase of industrial revolutions, or the four revolutions, depending on who you talk to and what they call them. You see vast arrays of textile machines, building machines. You think of the whole concept of the assembly line and what people are really able to achieve. Vast wheels and belts and infinite machines and very large compounds and when you look in the official historical account, you'll see that many of these were established even before the United States Civil War. Indeed, a lot of these compounds with their smokestacks were established long before 1860. It was often said that the reason the North in the United States Civil War had such a decisive advantage was its industrial capacity. Then, of course, you go back and you look and see how people were living. It's very interesting, though, that you see what appears to be mason construction or masonry construction, some sort of blocks or stones here and yet the people living in what appears to be squalor and in ruins. This is also the darker side of the Industrial Revolution, and the official account does admit this, that this isn't exactly the best way to live, that you have labor practices that are exploitive. But I ask the question, are all these large facilities old world remains, or are they ruins? Things that were simply found across the land and repurposed and pressed back into service, especially as certain aspects of technology were made available to the population and released in a control format, allowing people to slowly bring things 
back to an operational standing, to where they could produce things that the society, that the civilization needed. You also find numerous examples of an unbelievable number of bricks, and we saw that most recently in our exploration of St. Louis. And of course the explanation is, well, they produced all these bricks because they had the Industrial Revolution. And on the note of St. Louis, steam power was very critical, and steam power considered to be one of the greatest outputs of the Industrial Revolution, giving you the ability to drive ships up and down the Mississippi or whatever river you're operating on, and of course the steam power behind our mighty locomotives. And you'll find many pictures of locomotives next to smokestacks. And let's also not forget the amazing achievement, which was done by hand, of changing the rail gauge in the Southern Railroads. It's intriguing to me, though, to look at all the pictures and the renderings of not only the vast complex, but the vast machines that just seem to come up from really nothing in the 19th century. And then we'll be told that the official account tells us that we get to the 20th century, and then the United States especially, but the rest of the world, is able to continue to refine its industrial capacity, leading to the greatest industrial output achievement of all time, which was World War II. Oh yes, a global conflict, a very terrifying thing, yet at the same time, this is what we had from it, the result. Well, let's go back to the U.S. Civil War and the Tredegar Iron Works in Richmond, Virginia, 1861. Now, interestingly enough, the North was stated to have a great industrial advantage over the South in the United States Civil War. Yet, one of the main reasons they said that they located the capital of the Confederacy in Richmond was because they had the ironworks. This was decisive towards producing all the cannons and many of the other aspects of using iron and keeping the Southern Army in the field and fighting. I always found it interesting how the Confederacy was able to start a government from nothing, was able to start industrial capacity, essentially from nothing, and also to keep effective forces in the field fighting the supposed overwhelming advantages of the Union armies for four years, and fighting quite effectively in many places, although it depends what theater of the Civil War you study, and the Civil War is, of course, a very problematic account. You can find many examples of what the Tredegar ironworks produced that allegedly survived to this day. And I have no doubt that there were many things that they did produce, or they just had initials on them. You can also look at this rendering of the powder works. The powder works in Augusta, Georgia, which was also a very decisive industrial capability of the South during the Civil War. Well, this really existed, and yet it looks like a castle. Is this recycled old world? A facility that was found and repurposed to be powder works. Now you'll see in the caption in the bottom there that it was cotton mills, or became cotton mills after the conflict. So what came first? Was it built as a cotton mill and then repurposed into a powder factory? Or was it a powder factory that was repurposed into cotton mills afterwards? There's a lot of conflicting accounts just with this structure in and of itself. And regardless of whether it was used for the stated purpose of being for cotton or for producing powder, gunpowder, which of course you needed for all the cannons and all the musket rifles used at the time. Why does it look like a castle? I mean, think of it today. This could be repurposed into a high school quite easily. It looks like many of the high schools that we've looked at or some other facility or function. And why do you need to have three floors for a powder works or for processing cotton? That just never made any sense. Oh, look, it says 1880 on it. So we'd assume this picture comes from later, and it's why I always question the accounts that come with these pictures. This is George Washington Raines. He was the gunpowder guru of the South, also known as the chemist of the South. You know, it's a very intriguing figure, originally a U.S. Army officer who went to the Confederacy, and with his ingenious chemical know-how and processes, he was able to run one of the most effective powder companies in the South, and ultimately in the world, keeping Southern armies supplied with gunpowder. Quite an achievement. Here's what he looks like in his older days, so perhaps we can get the affiliation or belief that this was some sort of real individual. Now, did he come up with all this, or was this just something he had access to? And the Confederate Pistol Factory. Yes, it uh, looks like the farmhouse that I grew up in a little bit. Well, you can just turn that into a pistol factory. It makes sense, doesn't it? How many pistols did they really use in the Civil War? I always enjoy looking at some of these images, too, of uh, Civil War soldiers, because you have to think, this was the output of all that industrial capacity at that time. And the Confederacy didn't supposedly have a lot of industrial capacity. They also had very limited and rudimentary trains, although, conversely, we're told that the Confederacy effectively used trains in one of the first major battles of the U.S. Civil War, the Battle of Bull Run, and it assured them victory. You also have the 
recurring theme of people sticking their hands in their coats in the Civil War. Now, I'm showing a Confederate officer doing this because, I don't know, what's this really saying? This is an image of the Quaker guns, the using of logs as a deception, and it was quite effective. The Confederacy used it during the Seven Days Battles, or the Peninsula Campaign, that was commanded by this Union general, George B. McClellan. Apparently, McClellan and his generals and his army were very easily fooled by the Quaker guns, and this is how they explain the Union army being unable to seize Richmond. McClellan was a very controversial general, and he was never in good graces with the president. And, of course, we're told now, when we have our <laughs> new historical look at the Civil War, he really wasn't that bad of a guy. Ah, yes, more pictures of him sticking the old hand in the pocket. You always have to give that impression of conveying authority and presence, and it's always interesting to me that you have military officers who don't have all the buttons on their jacket buttoned. It just looks really, really cool, though, to stick the hand in the coat. Dear, dear, could you pull your hand out of your coat? Look, I'm comfortable with my hand in my coat. I don't know, maybe I'm being too rough on him. Perhaps it was the version of Al Bundy sticking his hand in his pants, and that was kind of uh, McClellan's way or every other officer's way of blowing off the cameras. Ken Burns is quite a fan of George B. McClellan, and he lamented in an interview about how he had to make George B. McClellan the bad guy in the Civil War documentary that he did. I don't really like to make anybody a bad guy. I really wanted to show people as they were. Yes. Well, other aspects of the Civil War, going back to the Industrial Revolution, is the achievement of constructing all the rifles and all these incredible cannons. I like how you have the individual there pointing in the district. Point it that way. But then there were also the Aerial Balloon Corps that we had from the Union Army during the Civil War. Interesting that they had the availability of hydrogen and they were able to deploy those things. Although, once again, it didn't result in a decisive advantage. And what's going on here with all these cotton bales just laid out all over town? How exactly is that efficient or making any sense if you're going to process and sell and move cotton? Then, of course, we see some of the vast industrial capacity that the Union possessed at that time. Very, very large compounds with large smokestacks. And, again, all constructed at a time when the Industrial Revolution was still going about. There's also the interesting capacity of the Union Navy to rapidly produce ships and push ships into service. Although we know that wouldn't compare with the unbelievable achievement of the United States producing thousands of capital ships in World War II. And 1859 here, Schofield's Ironworks. Great timing right there, just to have that in time for the Civil War. Another southern facility that we're looking at. And all the remarkable, incredible, and extraordinary cannons that they managed to produce. And you'll find no shortages of those. And clearly they had great destructive capability, as we've seen in the destruction photos we've looked at from the Civil War. You can still find some remnants across the south of some of these industrial facilities. And I always found it interesting that there were so many bricks. Once again, the old brick. The end of the Industrial Revolution. Heavy machines that didn't come about until 1819 to 1920. And the assembly line process. Now, why am I referring to the assembly line? Well, we don't believe the assembly line started until the 1900s, really. But you find the example of this Venetian naval arsenal that was running a production line in 1104. And official history says that this did happen. This is very impressive. And, of course, we have the old lion with the wings on it. I'm not sure exactly what animal that reminds us of. So, once again, something that seems to be bucking history and you can still go and visit this Venetian naval arsenal to this day, and you'll find some very remarkable structures that were completed long before the Industrial Revolution. Also the fact that the Venetians were able to churn out galleys en masse using a production line, long before the United States Navy had many ships that it was building, whether it was for the United States Civil War or World War II. And, of course, we think on the production line, and this is supposed to be an exception to the rule. Isn't it intriguing how there's always vast exceptions to the rule? Vast exceptions of things that occurred in the distant past, even though they weren't supposed to. Well, there's an explanation. Now, granted, we can't say it was the Renaissance, because 1104 was a little bit before the Renaissance. So, how exactly do you explain the fact that there was this kind of facility, with this sort of infrastructure, and the capability to run an effective production line? No wonder the Ottomans never stood a chance in the Battle of Lepanto. How can, you imagine, how can you match the production of galleys? Yet when you go around this facility, you'll see that it has the same intriguing architectural touches, and the explanation will be that a lot of this was added later. No, this wasn't all built in 1104. It was added over the subsequent years. 
even though they admit that the production line capability did exist as early as 1104. So it's yet another example. I really need to get and visit this uh, site in person because this is very interesting. You also have examples of architecture and <laughs> geometric pre precision that is well before the Renaissance even. But of course, we're not speaking of the civilization that came before that also supposedly had the capability, despite not having an industrial revolution. Looking at some of the renderings, though, of this great naval arsenal of Venice, you can see that they combine the infrastructural capability to make large facilities, these large buildings, that would, of course, just be showing up all over the United States in the 19th century because, of course, they weren't built, according to the official historical account. Yet you can see some very impressive towers and some very large buildings that seem to be facilitated to support every aspect of this naval arsenal. And why am I focusing so much on this naval arsenal? Because it's a prime example that the official account does acknowledge of having the ability to run a very effective production line well before the incipience of production lines in the 19th century. And, of course, if you go off of what the United States achieved in World War II, building thousands of capital ships in a very short amount of time. And, of course, and we remember what history tells us about how the Axis powers were always in great dread, especially Japan, although Germany refers to it too, about waking up the giant and bringing the United States in World War II because they just knew that the United States had the industrial capacity. Well, perhaps there was somebody in the United States who had read about this great uh, Venetian arsenal and decided they were going to employ some of these aspects in the ship construction. Capital ship construction is very intriguing in and of itself because you think of all the materials that go into it. You also think of the fact in terms of what kind of training you have to have within your production crew and to run an effective production line to build ships that aren't going to sink. As we know, when one sails the high seas, one's more than likely to encounter some very difficult weather. And there's not any record of a ton of galleys being lost because they encountered bad weather. So obviously they were made to specification. All right, returning back to the output of the Industrial Revolution. The large machines that just seem to get larger and larger when you look at different pictures. And of course people say, eh, it was because of the Industrial Revolution. We had a cotton spinning machine that was very advanced, and it's because we needed it. We innovated it. Well, perhaps we did. But whenever I look at the pictures, though, I'm always impressed by how quickly all this was built and implemented. And we took a look at this dam near Keokuk, Iowa, on the Mississippi earlier. And this was built from 1910 to 1913. And at the time, it was the largest or the second largest dam in the world, depending what figures and what statistics you look at. While they were building the dam, they also built this very large power plant in Keokuk, Iowa. And you might recall from our earlier explanation that Keokuk is one of those towns that seems to buck the trend because while it was slightly over population of 10,000 at that time, to this day the town has a population of less than 10,000. So who exactly were they building this large power plant for? What was the real purpose behind this dam? I mean, today you think this would make more sense in the Quad Cities. And of course, it's right in that very amorphous timeline in the very early 20th century, 1910 to 1913. And by the way, they constructed this very long and incredible dam at the same time as the power building that we just saw earlier. Again, with all the genera generators and everything else. You also have a very convincing six minute long movie that shows some uh, interesting construction of this dam. So yes, there's a movie. Therefore, you have to believe that it was done in 1910 and 1913. And if you watch it yourself, and I'm not going to tell you what to think, you'll find that there's the same questions with many of the pictures that we see. But come to your own conclusions. We also think of how the Industrial Revolution gave us the ability to do mining on a very large scale, such as pictured here, and the large mining machines that we now have. When you look around the land, though, in certain areas, you'll see that it appears to have been mined already by machines that had to be far larger than this one. Still, the colossal size of many of the machines that we do see pictured in the early 20th century and even the late 19th century don't seem to be very easy to explain. Also, the ability to move steam locomotives. We're told that steam locomotives were imported from Great Britain to the United States in the early 19th century. But how did they have the capability to really move them? Of course, we'll have artistic renderings of what sort of heavy machinery was truly available before the 20th century. And we also compare and contrast with what capabilities we were supposed to have with the Industrial Revolution. 
Well, look what Egypt was able to achieve in the Bronze Age with no Industrial Revolution. And the answer will be, well, they had forced labor. That's always the go-to answer. In fact, forced labor is really the cheat code prior to the Industrial Revolution. The venerable bulldozer, one of the real outputs of the Industrial Revolution. And we know that bulldozers are essential for all the aspects of construction. It's how we're able to build our modern steel factory so quickly. Oh, yes, a hamster wheel crane. I, I, I mean, a, a human crane, of course. Can you imagine getting in there and running in that uh, wheel? I know someone's going to patent that. And we compare and contrast that with the mighty hydra hydraulic cranes that we have now, the sky cranes that are involved in building all of our steel and glass skyscrapers that reach to the sky and are very durable with natural disasters. The Hanseatic League was in existence from 1200 to 1669, and they had no industrial revolution. Well, the Hanseatic League was a trade and commercial confederation of merchants that started in Germany. Yep, those Germans again. But it did include many other nations and many other ports. And these were some of the outputs that they had long before an industrial revolution. Some very impressive buildings with a lot of bricks. So how exactly do you explain all these bricks being constructed? Well, they worked harder. They were innovative. And as many residents of Cincinnati will tell me, they were Germans. So, where was this made? How and why? You can't say this was the Industrial Revolution and how many bricks, how many blocks went into these buildings. And many of these buildings are still standing today in these towns that they still call Hanseatic towns. Very intriguing consideration that such achievements were made. And of course, it's always, they didn't need an Industrial Revolution. They just worked very hard. Now, do you have any accounts of forced labor? Mm, not so much. The other explanation for the Industrial Revolution happening is because of the embracing of capitalism. And the Hanseatic League exists as an early example of capitalism. You're simply trying to turn a profit. Once again, though, they seem to have the ability to produce some very incredible buildings long before the Industrial Revolution with many different bricks and blocks. And, oh yes, they had some wondrous decorations and some columns. Now, naturally, the current account will tell us that many of these buildings have been renovated, and that's how they explain this away, as they always do. And it seems as though they're constantly renovating these buildings. And that's always a question as to why the renovation continues. Yet, if these buildings are left alone, they'll stand. Such as this one, where they explain away all these bricks because they had to renovate it, and it's rebuilt. But what's rebuilt and what's original? It's hard to say, and it's clear that it being hard to say is by intention. Well, no Industrial Revolution for Rome, perhaps the best example of a very old civilization from what we call antiquity, that was able to achieve stunning infrastructure long before any Industrial Revolution. Indeed, this bridge in what is now Spain is nearly 2,000 years old. So yes, those crafty Romans could build a bridge that is nearly 2,000 years old, and you can still walk over it to this day. And we needn't talk about all the great aqueducts. And one of the other explanations for the modern Industrial Revolution, or at least the one in the 19th century, or whatever time frame you want to give for it, is the fact that they had access to great canals and better infrastructure. Yet the Romans and the Egyptians had and used canals that are quote-unquote very well documented. <laughs> and let's not forget the stunning achievement of Roman roads. The Industrial Revolution contradicts uniformitarianism. It defies constancy of physical laws, and scientists argue about this. The uniformitarianism, meaning that it takes a very long time, humanity being around in its current form for 30 to 100,000 years, depending on what you believe about evolution, if you believe evolution, yet it supposedly takes a very long time to change things. But the Industrial Revolution completely contradicts this. So what to believe? Once again, it's the very thesis of conflicting accounts. The Romans had stunning achievements that we can still see the remnants of to this day. It's standing up very well. And it's stated that only very recently we discovered the formula behind Roman concrete. We didn't know it in the early 20th century. We didn't have the capability to construct or build concrete or to mix concrete that would survive in salt water. Yet it seemed to be no issue for the Romans. And those wonderful Roman roads Roads that were laid over a thousand years ago that still stand very effectively to this day. Quite a stunning achievement for a civilization that never had an industrial revolution. And you'll find no shortage of Roman roads and the fact that many of them, we know they haven't been repaved and they don't have a work crew going out there all the time. 
but you can oftentimes still walk, ride your bike, or drive your car on these Roman roads, and they're holding up quite well. Now, are they perfect? No, but compare and contrast that with all the work you see being done in your highway system, especially if you live in the United States, and you'll know what I'm talking about. But what do you think happened? Was it really a genuine industrial revolution, or was it simply old world remnants that were repurposed? And of course, we looked earlier this week at the Basilica of St. Peter and this great bridge in Rome. Again, all completed and constructed before an industrial revolution. Well, thanks for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe. That may be impossible, sir. Things are only impossible until they're not. Yes, sir.